great. So we're just waiting one second. Yep, sure. And we are here. Okay. So good morning, good morning, everybody. Again, we are on day five of the Global Happy Home Summit, where experts, leaders, professionals, practitioners from all over the world are really gathering and joining forces to support your family through the current challenges that, that you're facing. Um, and I have this morning Michelle Garnett with us. Good morning, Michelle. Good morning, Jess. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me, Jess. Oh, you're so welcome. I couldn't think of anybody else better to be in this space and your beautiful energy and the wealth of knowledge that you have is just perfect for all the families watching. So thank you. Thank you. That's amazing. Uh, thank you. So I would love um, for you, Michelle, just to give a, a, I guess, an introduction to yourself and, and what you what you get to do in this world. What, you know, what is it that you... <laughs> what a great do? question. What do I get to do in this world? Yeah. Uh, yes, I, I guess my main role in my working life is my passion for autism. So I've been specialized to the area of autism spectrum conditions and all the related conditions that can come along with autism for the last 27 years. And I, within that, have been able to do some amazing things like study with awesome people. Uh, I've learned a lot through, for example, Professor Turnwood and also my PhD supervisors. So um, Candy Peterson, and also uh, many other researchers around the world who have kindly shared their insights. Mm. But I guess primarily I, I really relate to being a clinician. So my intention is to assist families where there may be one or more members who have autism. And I'm also really into community awareness about autism and neurodiversity because it's a new science. We're just becoming aware more and more of how different neurology can be. So the package looks the same, but what's going on inside is actually quite different. And to be able to understand that really supports people who are experiencing neurodiversity, whether it's autism, ADD, ADHD, or learning disorders. Um, of course, there's many other conditions that come along. So while I'm a specialist, you have to learn about all sorts of mental health conditions, physical conditions as well. So this is my primary purpose, I guess, being a clinician to assist families where autism, autism is part of it. Yeah, beautiful. And, and you do, um, you get to travel the world and, and share this as well. Um, that's one of the amazing things that recently, comes up. Until recently. Yeah. Until recently, yes. <laughs> <laughs> However, you know, it was really amazing talking earlier before the interview started about what COVID-19 does, you know, how it, it kind of changed everyone's lives almost instantaneously. And it gives you an opportunity to find ways of uh, exploring your intention, bringing forward what you feel you're meant to be here for. And I was so, so fortunate as the COVID-19 affected us and we were in lockdown and I went into lockdown quite early uh, because of vulnerable members of the family. And we immediately transferred all our events onto webcast, the webcast uh, format. And since it started, and it's only been, I can't believe it, it I've been in lockdown three and a half weeks. Okay. And we've already okay. webcast four events. So in terms of still being able to get understanding out there about autism, it's amazing. And on Friday last week, our audience spanned New Zealand and America and England, as well as all over Australia. So certainly wow. with technology, you can still do a lot to yeah. families. It's awesome. Yeah, beautiful. You're still reaching everybody that needs you, which is so great. And yeah. so I guess because you're still having contact with all of your families, you're still having, you know, seeing, seeing your clients and I am seeing them like this. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, and these right. workshops and everything, what, I guess, what are the challenges that families are facing uh, just in the last couple of weeks that you've seen, Michelle, mm -hmm. is there anything mm -hmm. that's really um, stood out to you um, that they're going through with their children? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's interesting. Uh, a lot of my 
A lot of the parents I see are actually on the autism spectrum themselves and they described a bit looking forward to social distancing. So in autism, as you know, it, it like two's company, three's a crowd. We don't do crowds. So it's really quite lovely to be given permission for the first time probably ever in someone's life and not to have that social pressure. It's that's a big thing. The permission to be themselves, you know? Yeah. 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 Okay. And it becomes a new norm. Absolutely. That it you're not going to be freaked out that an, a kindly neighbor or friend's going to suddenly drop in unannounced. Sure, that's one sure. positive that's really come up. And also just a little bit, you know, because you're not going out as often outing, so the um Kids with autism, adults with autism are less bombarded with the sensory world and the social world. Mm. They can actually have more control over their day. They can institute their own routines and rituals. Mm. And they also end up with more time to do what they love, their special interests, because there's not as much getting ready for the day to be able to go out. And, you know, the travel time involved in going out. The, all, many of the events have been cancelled now. Yeah. So I think a lot yeah. of my clients are actually reveling in having more time and having social distancing, less affection. Awesome if you don't like to be squeezed. So there's some advantages for the, in this time for our families. However, having said that, some of the issues that have come up over the last week have been obviously um, massive fear about the future because of the uncertainty. And autism is uh, a condition that, tends to come along with a lot of anxiety and stress mm. particularly there's an it almost an intolerance of uncertainty so as the the world is facing a crisis that it's never ever obviously faced in our living memory it's mm. very difficult to know how long we'll be in lockdown in lockdown when we'll see certain families again if ever if they're elderly and living overseas so the fear of death of parents, of loved ones, of grandparents. Um, these are concerns that I found are bearing quite heavily on my clients at the moment. And interestingly as well, you know, and this to me this is interesting because autism has unfortunately been associated with the myth that people with autism have no empathy. And yet I found uh, in my clients they have massive empathy, very strong emotional empathy for feeling other people's pain. And at the moment, there's a mountain of pain out there. Uh, yeah. You know, there's yeah. a sense of grief and loss in almost every family, every country, whether they're grieving their old lifestyle or the loss of a loved one. And mm. the images of death and suffering on the news. And when you're very empathic, when you're sensitive to other people's pain, it's a lot. It's a lot, isn't it, to bear. So there are some of the themes that have come up. Yeah, and there's there's a lot there. So and there's both sides of the coin. And so I guess mm. for you, there's also, you know, children are not needing to go to school anymore. And I know yeah. that, you know, with the first part of what you've said there, this can actually be the best opportunity for these children and the most freeing for these kids mm. too. So is that what you're hearing and seeing too from some of your families? Is that, you know, now being schooled from home is actually going to be okay or are parents fearful around that because they don't know how to meet their children's needs? Yeah, both. Absolutely both. So I've ha I have some families where these are the families where the kids are uh, on the spectrum but don't have much ADD, ADHD, and they're okay with routine as per the way it's been set by the school. If the schools manage the transition well, maybe they're up, you know, a little bit already online they had laptops or they had ways of managing it uh, the online learning platform well the kids have been actually supported well through it and they're they're saying you know i can concentrate better there's not all those kids around me making noise and expecting me to chat etc things they don't want to do so the whole spectrum from that kind of well-managed transition with kids who are organized enjoying the solitary learning almost solitary learning because of course it's screens are very friendly for people with asd uh, but right through the spectrum actually to kids that just see this as holidays this is fun times why would i do school when i'm at home home is my castle i don't do school at home and so uh shifting gradually shifting that expectation that 
actually we're going to create a school in the home and we're going to you know make this special place for your learning and you're going to be visiting that a number of times during the day with breaks and you know you're still going to be able to have more free time but there's definitely for some families right now huge challenges to be able to not only manage their own workload from home but also manage their kids workload and having to prompt more having to be more available in case technology doesn't work or they don't understand the lessons and they have to interrupt their own work meeting come out very very stressful time for many families in that way mm, yeah and i think i'd i'd love to um for you to share just a bit of a an overview of what autism is um you know there might be some people watching here that have never really understood it before and you know you're absolutely the best person to ask so oh you thank you that jess up, that's a confidence i i'll do my best yeah autism i, I absolutely agree it's, it's it can take you a while to get your head around it i think my colleague tony atwood has given me the best definition of autism and that is someone who has found something more interesting in life than socializing so for that person oh, wow. <laughs> I love that definition. I love that, too. I love that definition. That's all that, oh, that nearly brings tears to my eyes, you know, because it's just absolute acceptance and appreciation yeah. for what, who they are and who they're not. I love that, Michelle. Yeah. It's beautiful. It's a wonderful one. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, our current scientific definitions of autism place it very much in the realm of a mental disorder or mental illness. And unfortunately, that categorization brings a lot of stigma. Uh, and so therefore, more barriers to getting along with society. But I think if we can embrace autism in what is actually the truth of autism, which is that it brings many gifts, many talents and abilities, and it brings challenge. And the key challenges tend to be social communication areas. So for someone mm -hmm. with autism, it's more difficult to, for example, use eye contact, to read a face, to be able to understand body language, and importantly, to infer what someone else might expect of their behavior or what they're supposed to do in a social situation. So yeah. they really can get very tripped up in how to make friends at school, how to keep friends, how to build conversations. Mm -hmm. And they need to find ways around all this, you know, coping mechanisms for that become really important. Mm. The other part of autism is actually a tendency to be quite routine. So we, you know, it's, it's called a disorder. It's very strange because many people with autism are incredibly ordered. So they can do order very well and they're not disordered i personally don't see autism as a disability i do see a difference you know a different way of thinking learning sensing the sensory world is perceived differently it's a different way of processing social information and therefore a different way of relating to other people so yes there's a lot of difference in it there's difference in terms of what's um, the person with autism may give you different response in conversation they, than you're expecting. They may behave in ways that seem rude or inappropriate or kind of hard to make sense of, but it's not a defect. In fact, when you know how the person with autism is thinking, their behavior and the way they respond makes a lot of sense. Very logical. There's That's a right. systemizes in the world. Exactly. It's a long answer because there's so much in the definition now. But essentially, it is differences in the social, how you do social, how rigid you are, tend to be single track mind or have a single interest that absorbs you, and sensory issues. So that different way, usually noise is too loud, lights too bright, certain amounts of touch just feel wrong, hence not enjoying action physical affection as much that sort of thing that's that's a really clear um explanation thank you and I, I do believe that when the definition comes from up above and as you say it's still being classed as a disorder and you know that's mm. def deficit based right and unfortunately yeah. when that's being filtered down to parents and that's the language that has been constantly repeated to them because as you know yeah. a lot of uh, my clients um, have autism and I work with these children too and you know the parents are um, 
you know, can't help but be affected by that language and, and then see it as something that needs to be fixed and changed when, you know, it's beautifully put by yourself that it's, there's such strengths and, and beauty in it that we just need to identify that and support that so they feel understood. The second children feel understood is when they'll thrive. So, yeah, I love, I love that. You know, I have a dear friend, Rachel, Rachel Harris, who's actually on the spectrum herself, and she's an author in this area. And I love it. She and I sometimes have quite heated arguments, for example, about early intervention with autism. And she says to me, Michelle, I think we should just back off, leave them alone, allow them to be their beautiful selves and support and accept their autism, embrace that as part of the whole human being in front of you and, and not try to fix the deficits. And I, I love that. I love that beautiful uh, way of seeing autism. I think for myself, I'm not quite so hard line. I feel if the person is coming in hugely challenged, for example, with how much language they have, and we know that stimulating the language areas of the brain are going to give them more communication. Uh, similarly, if you know how to socialize in Australia in a culturally specific way to Australia, it's gonna be easier to get a friend, to get a job, to get a partner. So I think it, it's kind of, I do think of autism and non-autistic -autis as a cultural difference and a cultural exchange program. And sure. I think, it's wonderful to embrace the differences of each culture, but also to understand each culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that way, there's inclusion and the person with autism feels connected and, and needed in society and liked for, as, as who they are. But um, everyone, every family will work out how to do that their own way. But I wanted to share, uh, I wanted to share Rachel's take on it because I love that it's just pure acceptance, which yes. is very beautiful. Yes, yeah. I love that A word, acceptance. It needs to be discussed far more, I believe. So thank you. Um, yeah. for, for the families that you support, Michelle, what, what mm. seems, and with the children that you work with, what seems to be the most, um, I guess, you know, you're clinically supporting these children and, and you're a practitioner. So what are you working on the most? I mean, how are you supporting these children? What, do you, what are you doing with them? So what I'm actually doing is mainly seeing parents and that's uh, very different to many of my colleagues at Minds and Hearts. My main uh, group of people that I see now are adults, adolescents, and I used to work with children for the first 20 years of my career. I'm not working with so many now. But obviously, uh, many of my adults are parents, and so the issues come up about usually anxiety. I think there'll be three distinct phases in this COVID crisis. And the, uh, the first one that we're still in is really transitioning into the new lifestyle. And as you would know from your own practice, our kids find transitioning really hard. Mm -hmm. And so with a lot of parents, I'm discussing bringing back some of the tools that perhaps they hadn't needed for a while, like uh, visual schedules, um, having a, a photograph of what is expected in the behavior now and next and later, you know, just simple, sequencing to help our guys trigger into new schedule but it's predictable it's not what i used to do i'm not going out to school i'm not going out to my appointments anymore but at home i'm going to be seeing my ot now and then i'm going to have a break and i'm going to have some morning tea with mom and then i'm going to have my own time so sure. you know and if there's no words to describe that, obviously we can, as I say, take photographs of it and put it on the fridges. That's the visual schedule. I love schedules. I think most of us as humans are supported by a plan. If we have a plan, there's more certainty and it can let our defenses just kind of ease a little, just relax down that we know, we know what we're doing today. Uh, part of the, uh, I guess, coping with COVID-19 as well as ensuring that we, I'm sure the viewers that we have today have heard this from many, but keeping that routine up is so important, particularly with autism. So even though they might not be um, quite as perfectly dressed with the shoes and socks and everything, uh, it's really important personal hygiene is still practiced, that it's mm -hmm. I, I'm really encouraging the part of the routine is having that shower every day or a bath every day, brushing teeth, brushing hair, 
going through the same things, putting on ironed clothes, fronting up for appointments on time, whether they're telehealth or still some are happening in the community. And also just being able to uh, schedule in things that are important. So as much as we schedule in personal hygiene, we're scheduling in me time, you know, time I can just relax, do my own thing, whatever that is, listening to some music, some, um, some craft perhaps, doing some gardening. Um, my daughter and I at the moment are planting new seeds, you know, doing something together as a family. Starting jigsaw puzzles seems to be a major one for my families. They just love the jigsaw puzzles. I love the jigsaw puzzles. Yeah. But have, scheduling in that family time, time for connection, because even though social distancing is happening, we don't want to lose each other. You know, we still want to be socially, we want to be socially close or emotionally close, but perhaps physically distant mm. to those people who are not living within our own home unit. Mm. So I think, you know, still encouraging that emotional connection and time is important. And yep. on the schedule, also having physical activity. Notice the government, I think it's the government um, chief medical officer is uh, really suggesting that for children, it's an hour of physical activity a day. It doesn't have to be an hour in a block, but if it's in say three 20 minute blocks or six 10 minute blocks and just working out with uh, children, what physical activity would be enjoyable? Can we still go to the park? Can we run together? Can we walk together? Uh, taking the dog out, all of those things are still allowed. So I think we really need to do that. For, for adults, it's still half an hour a day. So also talking to parents about when they're going to do that, how they're going to include that in the schedule. Mm -hmm. So there's quite a few uh, routine um, management issues and transitional issues I, find, I have found going on for families at the moment. Yeah. And part of that also includes helping people remember their calming strategies, just being able to breathe and just take a step back mentally when we're getting overwhelmed and checking in and seeing, you know, hey, how am I going right now? How's my heart rate? How's my tummy? Am I feeling okay physically? Because if we're feeling okay physically, we're probably going to be a whole lot better mentally. So just checking in regularly through the day and teaching breathing strategies online with people to help them bring that physiological arousal down if they are starting to get overwhelmed or feeling in a very unsafe state, mm. which I found is happening at the moment. Lots of yeah, things. absolutely. That would make sense. And, you know, I, I'd like to touch on, um, you know, the word connection and what it means. And because children and adults um, with ASD, this connection aspect can be challenging. So yes. for, for parents who you know, want to be able to use this time to connect with their children or or maybe struggled even before this happened, right? Now their children are home constantly all of the time. You know, how how do they use this opportunity to the best of their ability to really get to know these children that, you know, sometimes it's difficult to understand where they're at and connect with them on their level because it's hard to determine. So I guess how how do we how do we best connect with them? That is such a fabulous question. I think a lot of families are really um, working that one out as they go. As you say, probably really hard for many families even before COVID-19 hit. And now and there's been all sorts of uh, internet jokes, hasn't there, about, you know, oh, my God, I've got to spend all this time with my loved ones. How am I going to do this? I, don't usually, I can usually escape. And I think that's important to acknowledge that for one thing, we do still need to escape. We do need our own time as adults. And so in the planning, I guess, the routine of the day, what I'd be suggesting to families who are having difficulty with this, what I'd suggest to you is um, have a think about in the week, in the weekly plan, what sort of time can be allocated to oneself to give me time because I know it's an overused analogy, but I really like the analogy of the oxygen in the aircraft that you really put the mask on first. So if you're feeling well regulated, that you're getting your needs met, that you can have some time on your own to play with the dog, to read a book, to get online and do some playing games or doing some research, whatever floats your boat, do it. It's gonna be so important. 
and at that time allowing kids to have their own time because we all need that decompression time to just do what we love and if everybody in the family has got that scheduled in and also you're looking after yourself in terms of your physical exercise and your uh, your diet that you're not relying on junk food you're giving your, your body some nourishment then you're in a good space to actually be able to connect with the kids it's very hard other otherwise and then having a look in the schedule around well what sort of things do the kids like to do and when are they best to do it because it really helps they say families who play together stay together and I know I keep that maxim in my mind with my own family and also with the families that I work with. Yeah. And so then working out, well, what can we do that's fun? And with the range often in the family in terms of age, across generations, different interests, yeah. finding that meeting point can be really hard. And it does take a bit of negotiation, collaboration, compromise. But I do find for families that are, usually kids want to spend time with their parents they want that connection it's biologically wired in same for parents so we've already already got a really good level of motivation then it's around finding that time and certainly i find here with autism there can be a different a clash of cultures here so as much as it can be hard for any parent to connect with their say teenage son or daughter because of the individuation process and sense of you know, push, get away. I don't want to be with you anymore. Uh, similarly, there can be a, a sort of culture clash with autism and neurotypical parents, where the neurotypical parents really want to have that sit down, heart to heart. How are you going? What's happening with, you know, how are you going with this crisis? ASD kids don't tend to do that. They don't look at each other, eyeball each other and say how they're feeling and thinking. It's just not in their lexicon. So being able to perhaps share an activity like doing a jigsaw puzzle, doing the gardening, cooking a meal together, reading a book together, playing a game online together. These are nice autistic type ways of finding that connection. That's sure. that. And similarly, lots of kids on the spectrum love talking about their special interests. So just listening to them. Yeah. Practice active listening skills you know and starting to another part of it is turn taking with asd so you may find as a family as you think well you know one of you wants to um, play uno another wants to always play charades another prefers canasta or a, a different game and 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 everyone and then another it's movies but you can never choose a movie everyone likes you you have all these just Discussions, but taking it in turns is another really important, obviously, component, which may for many neurotypical families sound very obvious, but it's not obvious when it's ASD. Taking yeah. turns is hard because it's boring when it's not your turn. Stop. And they manage that very well. But that's a wonderful learning skill they can still have because obviously kids on the spectrum still need to be socialized even though we're in shutdown. And these are some wonderful ways parents can help socialize their kids to, uh, to set up some turn-taking, sharing interests, act, learning how to share conversational space, actively listening to what someone may be thinking or what they did in that day. And then it's the other person's turn. Yeah, beautiful. there's many, many ways to, uh, to do this. Uh, it's really just about I guess, being creative and thinking up what works for your family and, and really prioritize, like you say, that word connection, prioritizing that connection time still. Mm, yeah, thank you for sharing all of that. It's, yeah, that's very helpful. And the, one of the things that, um, you know, families are struggling with, uh, well, trying to find the answers to at the moment is tech time and game time. And, you know, oh. people with, you know, children, teens, adults with ASD, mm. uh, you know, it's a very calming uh, platform for them. It's, you know, it, it eliminates anxiety basically for, for all they know. You know, it's, it's very yeah. creative, which is a perfect environment for them. For yeah, sure. it's not social, it's, so it's perfect. Um, so I guess with this increased time being at home and, you know, that being a challenge for families too that I have um, been speaking to, mm. I guess what what is your opinion on tech time for children with ASD and all of that? And now that it might be increasing a little bit, yeah, mm. what are your tips and solutions? Yes. To 
Mm. It really is. It's one of the questions that's come up a lot, actually. It came up in Masterclass last week in our two events. We're really finding that many on the spectrum with so much more free time, their favourite thing to do, as you say, is screen time. And I think it's important, a few things are important there. One is definitely the quantity of time they're spending online. And I know the guidance from the research before COVID-19 was two hours a day, which most people were feeling, well, hang on, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, schooling academic curriculum is online. They're on their laptops to do their homework and their research. How do we do two hours a day? And then, so they sort of modified it and said, okay, well, Aside from school, where they're still doing a lot of face-to-face -face learning, etc., if they're in their own home, leisure time needs to be two hours a day, and that includes TV. So it's not a lot when you think how many kids would like to just stay on the school all evening and then all weekend time. I've, I've met many, I'm sure you have as well. And so one... This is a struggle that's perennial. We've been grappling with it even before COVID-19, as you know, and now it's just upped. I think the main thing to consider is uh, don't take it away. You know, if the person, usually if the person is really, really hooked into screen time, it's, it's definitely um, fulfilling a function in their lives. It's causing relaxation, pleasure, as you say, it can keep anxiety at bay, at least for that short time or long time that they're on the screen. The anxiety, by the way, boomerangs back when they're off the screen, so we've got to watch that. But the sort of guidance I'm giving families right now is to be, at the moment, a little bit more relaxed about screen time it's, it's going to probably be a little bit increased at the moment, and that's okay as long as it doesn't take up 100% of their time and as long as, and this is important and yet hard to do, every 50 minutes to an hour, they need to come off the screen and do something else. Okay. Yeah, and the reason I say that is because it actually is very good for the brain to have a rest from that intent eye gaze. Yes. The, intense concentration that a lot of these games rely upon mm. and also importantly it stops them going deeper into agitation because even though they say it relaxes them as any parent who's watching this knows if they've been on it for three hours straight they're not the same person they were when they went on it they've turned into this kind of scary person who's hard to relate to who's really yeah. quite snappish and difficult yeah, yeah. meltdowns are more common but we can allay that side effect of the screen time just taking those natural breaks and during that break doing something like you know feeding the dog or taking the dog for a walk or get, getting outside uh, it's very very therapeutic it sounds probably a little bit weird but taking our shoes off and just walking on the earth the bare earth and having that sense of the ground underneath the feet whether it be lawn or rocks or wading in the river if you've got that opportunity and having a, a sense of there's something else out there just to break that concentration yes. i usually say to parents try and still stick to a two three hour rule on a daily basis so because as, as you know a lot of our guys are getting on the screen to um to be social you know, they actually do meet up with their friends. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, that's the only way they can. Yes, so yes. you sort of want them to be meeting up with their friends, having FaceTime if possible, or um, role-playing games. It's mm -hmm. not the end of the world if they're doing that right now. They need a social connection and it's going to keep friendships operative through the shutdown period. But I think as well, we need to encourage them to get involved in other activities. So as I say, it's not 100%. We want yeah. them to be on the screen sometimes, but then out of doors sometimes, reading books as well or craft, doing something that actually requires different skill sets to come online is really important. I Related really, to yeah, family. Yeah. 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 I really like that that break time tip, Michelle. I think that's really wonderful. And I feel like everything you've just shared around that will really release some pressure. Um, you know, because I know that a lot of the parents I'm talking to they're just trying to do the best that they very can and make sure that during this time they don't get anything wrong, you know. So, it's hard, isn't it? yeah. yeah, and you want to do it all right, especially, exactly. yeah. 
that's another feature that can come on with ASD. Sorry, just to pop that in, you know, perfectionism and needing to just be the best mum or dad they can be during this time. But it's a difficult and challenging time for all of us. As you say, I think it's very important to give ourselves a bit of slack, like just to take the easy way sometimes, you know, yes. and operate with some self-compassion that this is tough. There's a lot of suffering. And even if you're personally not necessarily going to be dealing with loss or a loss of a loved one all i think many of us will have to face that but if even if that's not happening right now with social beings we feel other people's pain there's a lot of vicarious pain and anxiety going on right now and so just that can be a massive load for all of us yes yes yeah. thank you that's a really important point to make we can't yeah. help but feel yeah. all of this even if we're not directly affected yeah um, so, Michelle, um, you know, in, in slowly coming to an end, is, mm -hmm. there, is there anything that we haven't touched on at the moment that you feel is really important to share or anything else that you feel ne parents need to hear right now in your opinion or your, in your experience? Thanks, Jess. It's, I, I think the main thing I want to communicate to people right now is my main message is probably self-care to be able to really, even in the midst of a crisis, somehow find our own ways of coming back home to ourselves, to an inner sense of calm, peace, I've got this. I, I, I'm an imaginative, creative, intelligent being that can rise to this challenge. Or I can align with my values here. This is an opportunity to discover what my values are and I can come back home to those. And think if we do that life keeps being rich and meaningful and and importantly we have more to give others yeah. so I think my biggest message would be for parents please please take care of yourselves in this in this very strange and very very anxious time please yeah. look after you yeah yeah so Michelle how do you look up well what's what are your self-care methods I found um, I'm relying on them a lot at the moment, actually. Yes. They're good. I'm glad. I, I feel like, you know, the Beatles song, in the end, the love you take is equal to the love you make. And I think that's a beautiful one at the moment. I feel like for myself before COVID-19, I'm so grateful to myself for the connections I created, for the love that I gave. It comes back. Yeah. in the times of need and so for example the ways that i did that earlier are now coming back one of the things i embraced for example i think i was sharing it with you just before just before we started the interview is i went i used to go to these happiness conferences and they showed you all these ways you can increase your set point of happiness and one i love is the gratitude journal and it's very boring if you write out 10 things you're grateful for every day. That just gets lit really old really quickly. But if you can just dwell on three things that you're grateful for a week, that actually increases your happiness quotient. And I've noticed I'm just doing that a little bit more often. Not okay. so much once a week, but yeah. often daily, sometimes once every two days, just reflecting on what am I grateful for? Because it's very easy to feel sad for all the things we've lost you know i used to love uh going to restaurants going to my yoga classes etc and these are gone now and i don't know when i'll get them back and it's easy to be sad about that but but i'm so you know at the moment i'm feeling very grateful for the extra time i can spend with my kids that was one of my goals for this year and i'm like yeah. well, no, here wow. we are so it came true yeah. <laughs> life is yeah. I know it's so beautiful I'm grateful for the lives of my parents they're still alive you know the, the gratitude another one is you know for me that's huge is yoga so I've even though just prior to coming into the shutdown I was very lucky actually I got to have my knee reconstruction surgery which is nice because I'm now on a healing track and of course surgery like that will probably not be available for some time and so my yoga practice is very modified, but I'm still so grateful for, I'm grateful to all the teachers who have put their yoga classes online. So I can yeah. still practice with other people, even though I'm social distancing. And my own practice is enriched because of this um, 
the knee incident and also this different situation. So for me, it's gratitude and yoga and keeping connected with friends and family. So being able to use uh, this kind of meeting space online so wonderful what a gift you know to have this technology so i try to schedule at least one zoom meeting a day just to keep in touch with various people and uh, sometimes it's more than that sometimes it's less but just being mindful that even though i'm a natural introvert and i like the distance i need to have connection i'm still very human in that way so there's some of my own. There's probably more, but they're my go-to ones, Jess. Yeah, that's perfect. I think that'll that'll provide at least some ideas if people get stuck on it. How to start yeah. and just the easy ways to care for themselves and start altering that that focus and that mindset a little bit. Uh, so thank you. Yeah, and so Michelle, I, I like to finish off with two questions. Yes. So. And I think you sort of answered this first question, actually, and what you've just shared, which is beautiful. So for you in your world, what have been, you know, one or two of the beautiful opportunities uh, that never would have happened if COVID-19 never happened? It, I think one definitely is for personally, it's just narrowed everything down into what am I all about? You know, what are my values? What am I getting up in the morning for? Sure, because sure. it's suddenly you don't get as many choices as you had before. There's less noise, there's less distraction. I'm yeah. really welcoming that space. And mm. also, I must admit, it looks like a beautiful opportunity for the earth to recover. You know, I just think, oh my God, everyone was talking about we've got to stop flying as much, we've got to no. stop consuming. <laughs> And now the shops are closed. We can't fly. Like, how awesome. The the world may actually have an opportunity to recover. Mm. So I'm very excited about that. We're we're all kind of excited about that in our house. Yeah, I I love that one too. It's a lovely one, isn't it? People have, you know, very early on, I couldn't believe how quickly it was that the canals in Venice were clear. How, how amazing. The photos that came out on Facebook were just awesome of the weeds growing and the fish and oh, the birds, you know, it was very lovely. The swans on the canals and I've been, I've visited Venice. I love Venice. It's a very beautiful city, but it's, we love it too much. We're over loving it. We're strangling, strangling it with our love. And now it's being given a chance to breathe. And I'm hoping that this, uh, I'm really hopeful, actually, that perhaps as we now all get a chance to go home and tend to our families and ourselves, like tending to your own garden first, if you like, that when we come out eventually, that maybe some big changes will have happened, you know, shifts in consciousness of understanding what's truly important and maybe bringing that into the world in a more meaningful way than we've been able to before it's almost like a reset it it's, is. A, it's an amazing opportunity for for us individually and collectively so mm. i feel kind of tingly and optimistic and excited yeah about it. i feel that too from you i really do mm. and i think it's a gorgeous outlook and a mm. wonderful way of seeing it i love that thank you for sharing thank you. Thank you and too. final question is uh what does a happy home look and feel like to you uh, it's that's a good question. Uh, you know, I think I think it's really oh gosh, being a psychologist and ask that question, I have too many answers, and I know <laughs> I'm very verbal, so many words. But essentially, I hope that a happy home is somewhere where it's okay, it that you can be free to be yourself, you're free to be me, and that but that means respectfully too, because there's love there, and the love. Uh, is shown in gesture, in consideration, that each person needs to have their space sometimes, that each person needs connection. So we're kind of attuned to each other's needs and supportive of them. And we go out of our way to assist each other, but we, we're we not afraid to be ourselves, which means sometimes being angry or frustrated. And it's not the end of the world that those, it's human, those, those feelings are allowed too. And so I love, we used to use these lovely stuffed animals called kimochis and little lovey dove used to say, it's okay to be angry. It's not okay to be mean. 
And I think that's a really nice little maxim, you know, sort of mantra for the family that mm. we're allowed to have emotions. And right now, big reasons to have big emotions, but uh, to be able to have them responsibly and, and express them safely. And so people in the family feel safe. Uh, that anger's okay because it's not going to hurt anyone. It's yes. going to be just expressed as um, maybe some words and then that person may need some solitude or may need to do some physical activity to get the physical tension of that out of the body and or maybe write a poem or play some music, but that there needs to be a processing of that emotion. And so happy families to me are not always happy. Yes, but they yes. are, <laughs> but they're connected and they're attuned and, and they're doing their best um, when they can, when it's available to them to, to be there for each other. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, Thank no, so I, I really, um, you know, I've asked that question to all my speakers so far and the gorgeous theme that's coming through all of them is that it's really full self-expression and full acceptance yes. of that self-expression of wherever somebody's at and you know we can get really stuck in the perfectionism of our children of a home of our partner of ourselves that we don't appreciate you know the I guess let's call it the dark and the light you know we need both we need, we need all both. Kinds of emotions and experiences so I think, yeah, you've put it beautifully and I love, I love how you've explained it. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It's, it's, a, it's a question that I've, that's close to my heart. So that's why I had to edit my answer and give you it because um, most of my life I really, really wanted a family and they came late, my two. I have two beautiful kids that are now, one just turned 13 on Sunday and I have an 11 year old. Yes. So very lovely time, just a lovely time. And I'm so grateful they're here. But yes, that question, um, similarly, I entered in the family space, really wanting to be the perfect mom and thinking, you know, having studied psychology for so long and yes. studied yoga and thinking I've got so much to give. And I was completely shocked at myself when I started yelling at my kids. I thought I would <laughs> never do that ever. Then I realized, oh yeah, you know, you're human. You're human. <laughs> There's a bit of yeah. yeah, that's a surprise. Yeah. yeah. Mm. It's so strange, isn't it? This mm. you're right, we can really bring this ideal idealized view of what it is to be a parent. And it's lovely. To, I think it's wonderful that we aspire. I love being aspirational. It's it's really good, but to to hope for the best and but not to expect the best of ourselves all the time is probably a nice middle ground, I think, coming down yeah. from that perfectionistic view. Yeah. Yes. Thank oh, you. Awesome. Thank you, Michelle. And if uh, if people watching want to find out more or want to be involved in these online workshops, um, you know, really seeking some extra advice or support, yeah, sure. best to find you. Oh, yes. Yeah. So my, my most um, vivid presence in the public high would probably be the website that Tony and Atwood and I created, which is called Atwood and Garnet Events. So if you just Google Atwood and Garnet Events or Tony Atwood, it will come up. And then we, if anyone is interested in increasing their knowledge or their skill in terms of understanding autism and how to address the issues that can come up, you know, some of the challenges can be quite hard. Uh, that's, that's what we're about, that's what we do. Our next one is actually going to be webcast from here, my home, on the 30th of April, and it is for parents. It's, it's called Challenging Behaviour and Children with Autism Levels 2 and 3. So if anyone is watching and is struggling at home with a child on the autistic spectrum, having a lot of challenging behaviour, that's a great workshop to attend. And that's, and that's online. This is the beautiful thing. I'm so glad we can still be doing them even in yeah. shutdown. Yeah. Absolutely. Perfect, Michelle. Thank you for sharing that. I'm, I'm so you. grateful you joined us this morning. This has been Thank just such a gorgeous conversation. Um, and I know that a lot of parents will get something out of this. There's no doubt. So I appreciate your time. Thank you.
Thank you for inviting me on, Jess. It's been a real pleasure talking to you and sharing things with the audience. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you. And if you have questions, everyone, please pop them in. That's what this is here for. So don't leave anything unsaid or unasked because this is your opportunity um, and we're both here to support you. So thanks for tuning in and, um, and I'll be seeing you this afternoon for two more amazing interview speakers. We're still on day five and, uh, and I can't wait to share this afternoon with you too. Bye for now. Bye, Michelle. Bye.